Hi, everyone, and welcome to Night School. I'm Lynn from the Nightlife Programming Team. And I'm Christina, the event producer. Thanks for tuning in. We missed you all the last couple of weeks. Um, hope you've all been doing all right and taking good care of yourselves and others. Uh, we know it's been a stressful last week, let alone stressful year, but we are back and so excited for tonight's Night School, all about jellies. Yeah, um, jellies are the perfect way to return to night school. Um, you don't want to miss any part of this night. Um, we have some like people who really, really love jellies, and I'm pretty sure you're going to get to see baby jellies, which are actually very cute. Um, so we're kicking things off with Julie Burwald, who's the author of Spineless, The Science of Jellyfish, and The Art of Growing a Backbone. Um, she has jelly limericks, so don't miss that. Um, next up, we have the Academy's own Raya Even. Um, she's a biologist at our Steinhardt Aquarium, and she's going to tell you all about your favorite Academy jellies and how to care for them. Um, we have evolutionary biologist Anna Klompen, who studies jelly venom, and she's going to break down the science of toxins, stinging cells, and bust some jelly myths. 
And finally, staying up late to join us is science illustrator Nick Bazayo to show off his amazing illustrations of jellies from his Jellyfish of the World Guide. And as always, tonight's program is live. So say hi, let us know where you're watching from, share any comments or questions in the chat. We'll have Q and A's after each present presentation. Uh, so get those questions in and we'll pass it off to Julie now. Hey, hi everyone. Thanks for um, being here tonight. I'm so excited to be part of night school. Thanks for inviting me. It's it's a joy to talk about jellies as always. Um, so I wrote this book about jellyfish, but I wasn't always uh, into jellyfish. In fact, I started off as a, a phytoplankton girl. I got my PhD in ocean science um, down at USC and I was working back then on how much carbon dioxide the oceans take up. Uh, you, and we, it was the first time we got to learn how to do that with satellites. And um, here you can see phytoplankton, you can see how cool and beautiful they are. I think I have always loved beautiful things and maybe that's why I eventually made my way to jellyfish. But um, I wasn't very good at this. I actually was kind of bad at it and I fell off the academic path before I, move on, I wanna just tell you the answer to the question I was trying to solve um, back then is 36%. So the oceans take up 36% of the fossil fuel emissions that we've emitted, but I, did, I never made it to solving that problem. Um, what I did do was uh, I started writing textbooks about science and a bunch of articles, and I found out that I really love to do that. So. I, um, I kind of had this little gig going with National Geographic, which was really amazing. And I got asked to fact check this article, which is called the, the Acid Sea. And this was right up my alley because it was also about like carbon dioxide emissions. So um, I said, sure. And one of the things in this article was this graphic. And this graphic says, who struggles and who thrives in a more acidic ocean. So carbon dioxide, like what it's doing to our atmosphere, besides heating up our atmosphere is also, you probably know, it's driving the pH lower in our oceans and lower pH um, is thought to make it harder for animals to make shells. So things like crustaceans have shells, this should be cuttlefish, they have a shell inside sea stars and coral, they all make things with calcium carbonate, which is harder to make in a more acidic ocean. Clownfish are on here, and this doesn't look like a clownfish at all, but uh, they're on there because there were some studies showing that they actually lost their sense of smell when the pH went down. Actually, a lot of that is mm, maybe not so true anymore, but that's another talk. Um, on the winter side, though, in this graphic were things that photosynthesize, and that makes sense because there's actually more carbon dioxide available, easily available in lower pH water. So kelp and microalgae could do well. But then I saw jellyfish and I was like, jellyfish? Are they really going to do better in a ocean with lower pH? Like, has anyone tested that? So the first thing I did was what like everybody does. I Googled it and I found this crazy stuff. Like, oh my gosh, jellyfish might be our overlords. And I didn't even know it. Jellyfish are taking over the seas. Jellyfish are taking over the ocean. And I was like, I study the ocean and I write about it. And I never knew jellyfish were doing all this business. So then I went into the scientific literature and I, I found like, really, it was hard to say what was going on. There was this one study, this was from Japan. And um, you can see here we have problems with jellyfish. Um, at each decade of the 20th century. And so um, early on, it, there were problems with fisheries. That's what this blue line is here. And you can see there are examples of that, like jellyfish get into fishermen's nets and they sting the catch and that's a problem, or they bump into aquaculture facilities and that's a problem. And, and those things happen, you know, they happen. Um, but then there's something new started around the 1960s people going to the beach has started to get stung by jellyfish. That's the green part. And so here's a, this is a really bad stinger in the Mediterranean, just littering this beach. 
Um, but the thing is, before the 1960s, were people really going to the beaches that much? Because we were at war, there were wars, world wars going on, there was a depression. I mean, maybe this was just because more people were going to the beach. And then this problem of power stations. Jellyfish can swarm into power stations and uh, get into the machinery and that they use, a lot of power stations use, um, Gel, use uh, seawater to cool their machinery. And if jellyfish get sucked in, then they have to shut them down. And that started happening in the 60s. And it, it continues today. But again, like, weren't we building a bunch more power stations in the second half of last century? So how could we say that jellyfish are really taking over the ocean? I had a lot of questions. So what I did was I started calling up jellyfish scientists to just ask them, like, what's up? And um, they told me all these answers. And, but to make it more fun for me, I've decided to make limericks out of some of the questions I had. And then what I'm hoping you'll do is type in the chat the last word of the limer limerick, like, wait, wait, don't tell me, kind of. Um, and then I'll tell you, like, kind of the science behind the end of the limerick. So here's my first one. Um, jellies start life as a dollop. So small, its form might call up. A shrimp size knickknack or a furry tic-tac, which next turns into a, and I'm gonna read it again, just so you have a chance to type it into the chat. Jellies start life as a dollop, so small its form might call up. A shrimp size knick-knack or a furry tic-tac, which next turns into a, polyp, someone, Paul Atwell, great job. Yeah, the answer is polyp. So here's the cool and amazing life cycle of the jellyfish, which I think you will learn more about. Um, so I'll just go over it kind of quickly. But jellyfish have a medusa stage. That's the part we love and we know. And um, it swims around the ocean. And then they make eggs and sperm, which turn into this little planula larvae, which is basically a furry tic-tac. And then that tic-tac settles down. It likes to, most of them like to live sort of upside down. I might be corrected on that, but um, they like to attach, they do attach onto something hard and then they grow into this sort of sea anemone shape. And they can live like that for, we don't even know how long. Tic -tac, uh, polyp, tic -tacs. Polyps in the wild are kind of mysterious. Of the, I don't know how many, it depends how you count, but several thousand spe species of jellyfish We've really only discovered a couple dozen in the wild. The rest, we only know from growing them in the lab. So they're quite mysterious. But then an even more interesting thing happens. Um, so here's actually a picture of a bunch of polyps. Uh, here's the polyp here and here. But then when something changes in the water chemistry or the light dark cycle, or we're not exactly sure what, they slice themselves horizontally, like into this stack of pancakes, it's called strobilation. And then each one of these little pancakes pops off the stack. So one polyp can then become like 20 of these tiny, beautiful baby jellyfish, which I, you're, I'm so excited to see later. And they're called Ephyra, and they look like swimming snowflakes. There's no other way to say it. They are beautiful. But what happens is you can see like just a single, polyp can become actually these i'm uh, sorry these polyps have the ability to, to split also they can uh asexually divide so one planula can become a whole field of polyps and then a whole field of polyps can become just dozens of aphyra and that's why we see jellyfish in bloom so often um and they have just so that's their amazing cool life cycle all right next limerick um, consider the life of the jelly. Its tentacles are like vermicelli. You might think it's crass, but it eats with its ass because it has just one hole in its... Okay, I'll say it again. Consider the life of the jelly. Its tentacles are like vermicelli. You might think it's crass, but it eats with its ass because it has just one hole in its... <laughs> Belly, Nicole St. Dennis, thank you for that answer. That's terrific. Yeah, jellyfish have this really interesting anatomy as well. So just like us, they have an epidermis, that's our outer skin, and an endodermis, which is what lines their gut. Um, but in between they have jelly, it's called mesoglea, and it's really just like watery stuff. Um, 
And so that's going to come become important in a little bit. Um, so this is their belly and then this is their mouth and then hanging off their mouth are these long lips, but they're actually called oral arms. They're loaded with stinging cells. And then around the edge of the jellyfish bell, there's tentacles, which are also loaded with stinging cells. So the jellyfish captures its food with these stinging cells, passes up to its oral arms and into its mouth and into its belly where it digests everything it can. And whatever it can't comes right back out that mouth. So it's a multifunctional organ, um, but that's how it lives its life. All right, next one. Limerick number three. Meeting this jelly would be a surprise, and not just for its fingernail size. The toxin within it can kill in three minutes, and it hunt, hunts with its 24. Okay, again. Meeting this jelly would be a surprise, and not just for its fingernail size. The toxin within it can kill in three minutes, and it hunts with its 24. Eyes, Nicole St. Dennis again, Sarah Thompson again, Mary Ellen Reed, way to go. Um, yeah, the answer is eyes. So uh, back to this anatomy picture. So this, these little things um, around, like in between, if you look at the edge of a jellyfish, you'll see sort of these scallop shaped things, like uh, around the edge of a parasol. Those are called lappets. And then, um, in between each one are these little round, if you look really closely next time you are at get to go to the aquarium, you'll see there's sort of like an intensification right there. Those are called repelia. And that's like sort of functionally the jellyfish's face. It has a, something called a touch plate on it, which is how it kind of smells the water and senses current. It has basically the same as our inner ear, like a balance organ that tells it which way is up and down. And it has some way to sense the light. And on this kind of jellyfish, which is a moon jelly, which is kind of your average, most standard common jellyfish that you'll see in a lot of aquaria, um, the light sensor is kind of vague, light dark, not, not a lot of detail. But the box jellyfish, which is uh, in this group, is the most toxic jellyfish in, in the world, I think. And I might be corrected on that later on in this show also but um the box jellyfish have here's their repelia and um this one's not the most toxic one this one's from the dominican republic oh no puerto rico and it's not crazy toxic but anyway if you blow it up it looks like this and then if you blow it up some more it looks like this and you can see it has one eye two eyes three four five six and it has four of these one on each corner it's a box so six times four is 24, so it's 24 eyes. But what's the most amazing thing about this is that these two eyes right here are, here's the, they have a lens, they have a retina, and they even have an iris that, uh, that opens and closes. So this picture right here is a picture of its eye and the, in bright light, and you can see that its iris is closed down to limit how much light comes in. And here it is in dim light and where it's widened out so that it can let more light in. So these guys are like visual predators. They're hunters, they can see, they can dodge stuff. They're totally amazing. So they might be as the, as our, the, the title of the show is like brainless, lungless, something else-less, but they're definitely not visionless, they can see. Okay, last one. Um, a duck swims, well, like a duck, kicking back on the water with a cluck. Jellyfish swim, pulsing out and then in, making forces that both push and, I'll, uh, I'll say that again. A duck swims, well, like a duck, kicking back on the water with a cluck. Jellyfish swim, pulsing out and then in, making forces that both push and suck. Once again, Nicole St. Dennis. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, suck. And someone else here. Uh, Carla Schmidt Commons. Good job. Chantal Wallen. Excellent. Yes, the answer is suck. So let me show you how that works. Um, okay, one of the places I went was uh, Woods Hole Oceanographic. 
Oh, sorry, the Marine Biological Lab in Woods Hole, Massachusetts. And they these guys were making jellyfish robots when I was there, which was amazing. So here's a picture of the robot. And uh, they stuck it in the water and they turned it on and it, and it went whoop, like it jumped forward. But then when it opened, it went boop, right back to where it was, like a yo-yo, whoop, 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 whoop. And then this postdoc was like, wait a minute, we forgot to glue on the peplo, like the pretty part of the jellyfish bell that makes that kind of flowy um, look. And so they pulled it out of the water and they glued that on. And here's here's what happened. So here's the data, like with no flap, the jellyfish didn't go anywhere. When they put the flap on, suddenly it went boop, 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 boop. Then they cut, they cut it, they segmented it. And um, without the flap again, it didn't go anywhere. But once they made lappets, then it really started to take off. And what's going on is so cool. This is sort of, view this as like almost like a weather map of, of a jellyfish. So here's a jellyfish from the side. You're looking at it in profile. And this is low pressure above the jellyfish and high pressure underneath the bell. And there's more low pressure up on top. So that means the jellyfish is actually getting sucked through the water like a straw. And the whole reason it does that is because those lappets create these turbulent eddies that spin around to the top of the jellyfish and create a low pressure zone that sucks it through the water. And then this is amazing, but here on the Y axis, we have cost of transport. So how much energy you have to use to move yourself. And um, on this X axis, you have weight. And if you look at jellyfish, they use the least energy of anybody to swim. So they're much lower than a fish or a squid or a crustacean or even a flying bird or a running animal. Jellyfish are the most efficient swimmers in the sea that they've studied so far. Pretty cool. So after I learned all this amazing stuff about jellyfish, I was like, okay, but still I don't understand like what's going on out there. Are they taking over our planet? And um, there was some, some thoughts that maybe it could. And so the question is, is jelly, are jellyfish on a joyride? And they might be for some reasons. Um, you know, we're polluting the oceans a lot and that's decreasing the oxygen. But because jellyfish have that gooey jelly inside, they have really low metabolism. So they can handle these low oxygen zones better than other animals that use more oxygen. Climate change could be spreading out the, um, the, the parts of the ocean where jellyfish can live, it might be increasing their habitat. Also, jellyfish are really good at vertically migrating. So they can go down to the cool water, hang out, go up to the, in, um, to the surface to feed at night when no, one, no predators can see them. They're pretty good at that. Uh, we're overfishing our oceans and that's doing a bunch of stuff. It's, it's changing the seafloor, um, messing it up for other animals, but leaving these rocky outcrops where the jellyfish polyp could maybe live. We're changing our coastlines by developing them. Again, that's creating hard surfaces where jellyfish polyps could live. So we're doing a lot of things that might be changing the world for jellyfish in their favor. And um, one jellyfish scientist I talked to had this drawing which shows that in the past we lived in, we had an ocean that was full of big animals, sharks and tunas, and turtles and sunfish, all these big things, but we've we fished them down. And, and so we've taken away things that compete with jellyfish for food or eat jellyfish. And so we have this ocean right now, which is much smaller than it used to be. And the question is what's gonna happen in the future? Will we have an ocean full of jellyfish predators? It's unclear right now, but some people think maybe. Data on jellyfish is really hard to come by. Um, Here's one way to look at it. This is the whole planet divided up into what are called large marine ecosystems. And this analysis was done by a scientist from British Columbia. And what he did was he said, okay, the data is bad on jellyfish, but I'm gonna just kind of go with it anyway. So in these orange places, jellyfish numbers seem to be on the rise. Mm, maybe the data is not solid, but that's the way it's trending. In these red places, Jellyfish numbers look pretty much like they're increasing. Green means they're staying the same and blue means they're decreasing. But when you look across the whole world, even given kind of the state of jellyfish data being poor, 
64% of our coastlines are places where jellyfish look to be on the rise. And I said, well, I want to go see some of them. So I chose this spot first, which is Japan. And then I chose the Mediterranean second. And I'll show you what I found. Uh, I wanted to see this giant jellyfish. This one can live, can grow to be the size of a refrigerator, like four or 500 pounds. It was only seen every 30 years in the 20th century. Now it's shown up almost every year in the 21st century, probably as a result of pollution and coastal change and overfishing. Um, here I am with one that was about 250 pounds. This fisherman took me out and let me look in his nets. Um, this was, I wasn't here for this event, but this was one of the greatest jellyfish blooms in history. Um, I also went jellyfish fishing, uh, which is, there's a pretty decent jellyfishery in um, Japan, also in China. This is uh, Shinichi Uye. He's a jellyfish scientist from Japan who took me out fishing. And this is the guy uh, from British Columbia who did that previous study. And we caught these jellyfish called Ropalima esculentum, or the red jellyfish in Japanese. Um, and this is the part that you eat in Japan, those oral arms I was telling you about. Um, and basically you have to kind of pickle it. You pull the salt, the water out really fast. Um, and then it's kind of stable. And then you rehydrate it, wash the salt out, and then it, it's full of proteins, full of antioxidants. It tasted to me a lot like, here's jellyfish salad. It tasted to me a lot like green peppers. So tastes like what you put on it. It was good though, I liked it. Um, I went to uh, the Eastern Mediterranean Sea because I wanted to see the results of, oh, something I forgot to mention, which was translocation. As we open up our oceans to more movement, um, jellyfish can move around oceans easier. And this one has, this one's named Ropalima uh, nomadica. It used to live in the Indian Ocean. It has moved into the Mediterranean Ocean now where it blooms, huge blooms for 10 kilometers or 100 kilometers every summer and it keeps people off the beaches. It could have maybe moved through the Suez Canal or it might've come over in the ballast water of a boat. And the Mediterranean has warmed disproportionately um, and so this Indian Ocean species now can live in an ocean where it never used to exist. Um, the last place I went was the eastern side of the Mediterranean. And um, here is, this is place is called Mar Menor. It's beautiful and people have vacationed there forever, but now there are so many jellyfish that um, they have to install all of these, these are jellyfish nets and they have to install them along like 35 miles of the coastline every um, every summer before people can go swimming in order for them to be able to swim in this ocean now. Um, I It was beautiful. Here I am on the boat with the guy who's who's actually installing these these nets. And and I just looked back at the shoreline and I thought how I think of the ocean as this place of freedom and wildness. And we were basically creating our own prison in order to go into the ocean. But not to leave you on a down note, I mean, I think that what's happening in the ocean is worth our not, our, us noticing. And it turns out people are. The reason I went to Spain was because there was this jellyfish bloom symposium, you know, as, a, as opposed to in the past where people, scientists largely ignore jellyfish. There's a huge and vibrant jellyfish community, and you're gonna hear from some more of those people later, who are studying jellyfish and finding out just how cool they are, how amazingly well adapted they are to the ocean, what makes them just incredible animals. So there's a blooming of our of our interest in jellyfish and what's happening out there in the oceans. And you know, I think that's where we can find a lot of hope. So thanks guys. Oh, if there's time for questions, I'll take some, but I might have gone over my time. <laughs> hey, Julie. Uh, we have time for maybe like two quick questions. Okay. Um, first, love the limericks. Um, <laughs> but our first question, so we're getting lots of questions about um, their vision. So speaking of the 24 eyes, do they have good vision and how can they process what they see without a brain? Okay, it's such a good question. You know, and, it, and it's one of those mysteries that still exists out there. Um, I don't know if we know, well, okay, so the, the, the kind of the best science on it right now is those eyes are called special purpose eyes. 
So even though they're not cephalized, each eye has kind of one job that it does. So one eye looks up and makes sure that the jellyfish stays underneath the mangrove, ca mangrove canopy where it lives. One eye looks uh, out and looks for the flashes of light of the shrimp that are its prey. So each eye does a different thing. And maybe by having like just a special purpose, there's enough processing power in their neural net networks that they can, that they can, well, there is because they do, they swim like fish if you watch them swim. Yeah. So they're figuring it out. Cool. Yeah. It makes, that makes me feel like I need more than two eyes. I know, right? <laughs> um, the next question. Uh, the next question is, when you say the jelly is four, 400 to 500 pounds, so the giant jellyfish you showed, how much of that is water weight as opposed to its own tissues? So 95% of a jellyfish is water. So it's a lot of water weight. But what is, you know, what is the most amazing thing to me about this jellyfish is, is just like all jellyfish, it is born like, like the size of, I mean, I don't know, it just, it, it's born like this big, but in one year, it eats enough to become 400 pounds. Wow. So, because the Medusa doesn't live very long. The polyp stage can live like decades, but the Medusa stage only lives a, a year or maybe a little more than a year, some maybe two years at the most, but in this one, it's really a year. So it goes from this big to that big in one year which it's like vacuuming up everything that comes across in the ocean. It's amazing. Crazy. Um, yeah. We will actually be showing, I think, maybe one day old jellies awesome. later on in the, in the program. So you'll be able to see how small they started and then knowing yeah. that it got to 400 to 500 pounds. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Cool. Um, I yes. think that's all the time we have, okay. Julie. Thanks but thanks so, so much. much. Um, up next, we have Raya Even. Um, who is our academy? One of our own. Hey, Ray, you're muted. <laughs> Let's start that again. Hi, everyone. I'm so happy to be here talking about some of my favorite animals on the planet. Julie was so great. Uh, she showed you a lot of things. Um, I'm going to start off uh, just with a little recap about jelly biology before I really dive into behind the scenes at Steinhardt and what we're doing at the Academy. Um, so Julie went over a lot of this, um, but I've got a little fun uh, video for you guys. Um, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself as you guys get reacquainted with the jellies in their life cycle. Um, so I've been at CAFS for about four years. I've been working with jellies since the first day I walked through that door. Um, I started my lifelong obsession with them way back in 07. Um, went to school for marine biology um, and started with doing research with Hubs, Hubs Research um, at SeaWorld. That's where I fell in love with um, keeping things in aquaria and really fell in love with invertebrates and jellies are an amazing example of uh, our invertebrates. So at cast stop, <laughs> sorry, it's playing automatically. Um, oh my goodness. Okay. Sorry guys. Why are you doing this? No. You're going to stop. Okay. Sorry, folks. Um, so at uh, at Steinhardt, uh, we've been able to work with a variety of different jellies. Um, all of them that we've worked with in our new building are pictured here. So we've worked from everything from our tropical jellies, including Lagoon, Blue Spot, and Upside Down, to our cold water jellies, Moons, uh, Brown Sea Nettles, Purple Stripes, Japanese, and currently in Venoms right now, we have some really cool egg yolk jellies. Um, those polyps are really the backbone behind our propagation. As Julie mentioned, the Medusa, these adult stages don't live for very long, um, but those polyps, I've seen polyps live in my career. I have known some old timers who've had polyps for 50 years, so they can really hold on um, and really be the backbone of some propagation uh, in my field. At the academy right now, 
we are working primarily with uh, moon jellies. Um, so you've probably seen, if you visit the academy, that large cylinder in the middle of the aquarium. Um, these guys are really fun to propagate. They're also the backbone for a lot of our food. Um, I'll get into that a little bit later. We're hoping um, to be propagating soon our uh, brown sea nettles and those uh, egg yolk jellies that we have in our venoms exhibit. We do have egg yolk polyps right now. They're just being a little tricky to get to strobilate. Our moons just strobilate all the time. They're great. They just go for it. Um, our egg yolks are going to take some convincing. And then our nettles, we don't have polyps of right now, but we have really mature uh, male and female on exhibit. So we're hoping to be able to get gametes from them and settle out the planula larvae. Um, in the past, we have done all of these at CAS. We just don't have a whole bunch of um, displays for them right now. So in the future, we may go back to these. We've got plenty of room, and I'm going to show you that room right now. So JCH Jelly Culture and Holding is this beautiful room set up with tons of space. Um, so down here in the left-hand corner, these are wet tables. These are where our polyps hang out. Um, so on the left, these darker tables are set up for our warm water jellies, if we ever get them again. Um, that dark allows us to keep it nice and warm with all the lights that we put on it. Our lighter blue is for our cold water jellies, so we're not absorbing as much uh, of the lights that we have on them, and it helps keep it cool. Uh, we have got an upper and a lower deck. When these guys are up and going and we're getting lots of strobilation, we need a lot of space. Um, and that is just for the polyps. Everything else here is grow out. Um, so I'm gonna show you some little babies right now and we have to take those and grow them up. Um, so it takes a little bit of time, but we're gonna take a little walk through JCH with my colleague, Kylie. So here's Kylie walking in. And you can see this is JCH populated and getting going. I've got some jellies, some little moons growing out, bigger moons over here. She's coming over to our wet table, turning on our lights. Um, so these are our polyps. We're gonna take a quick look in there and get a feel for exactly how tiny these guys are. Um, so our videographer is trying to find our Ephira right now. Those again are the little baby jellies that pop off of the polyps. They're super hard to see. There's probably several hundred in those bins right now. You can kind of see the polyps there. They're the white fuzzy things. Um, again, these guys are super, super, super tiny when they're in this part of their life stage. So we're gonna hop over to our other bin. Um, those were our lab labiata moons. These are our uh, Are Aurelia, bleh, sorry. Um, there you go. You can see some of our polyps right there, those white fuzzy things. And now Kylie is going to give us a nice little close up of our babies. So our Ephira. Um, and you will see just how itty bitty tiny these guys are. They are super ridiculously cute. Go, 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 go. Look at him go. Yeah, they're really cute. Um, so from that little pinpoint, we've got to raise moons up to bigger than what my head is. Um, but they are really, really fun to work with. Uh, pause. So in order to get them to grow, we got to feed them. Um, the title of my talk was Don't Feed Them Peanut Butter. Uh, there was actually an experiment done in 2014 by my colleagues at the Dallas Zoo and Aquarium. If you look it up in Drum and Croker, it's a really fun paper. Um, they tried to raise moon jellies on peanut butter um, because feeding them um, what they commonly eat in the wild and what we do at CAS is really challenging. So they were trying to find different ways to do it. They were able to get them past the Ophira stage, but they didn't really thrive. So in order to make jellies thrive, we have a lot going on at CAS. Um, in the upper left-hand corner, this is our mad scientist room. Um, all of those tubes are about four feet tall, um, about 12 inches in diameter. That is all phytoplankton. And that is the beginning of the culture that we have to feed to our other cultures, which we uh, then feed to our jellies. And then we feed those jellies to other jellies. It's a big, long process. So the phytoplankton gets fed to our rotifers, our, also our artemia or brine shrimp, and our copepods. Uh, the copepods are a little fussy. These are like a special treat for our jellies. They're super, super nutritious. But mostly what our jellies are going to be eating are rotifers, 
Artemia or brine shrimp and moon jellies. Um, the moon jellies really like uh, the rotifers are brown sea nettles, really like crustaceans. So they're gonna go for the brine shrimp um, or actual krill that I'll feed them by hand. And then our egg yolk jellies are medusivores, meaning they eat other jellyfish. Um, and that's a big thing in the jelly world. There are tons of jellyfish who like to eat their cousins. Um, so we're raising all this, and then we're also propagating moons so that we can feed our other jellyfish. So it's, it's a fun cycle. Uh, other challenges with jellies, uh, Julie was really cool in talking about how they're the most efficient swimmers, which is great, but they're not as good at swimming as fish. Um, so they're really good at vertical migration. They can move up and down, but if they want to move against any kind of current in the water or get out of a mola mola's way that's trying to eat them, it's not going to happen. Also, uh, if they get into the corner of a tank, they can't get back out. So all jelly uh, tanks that you're going to see anywhere are going to be round in some kind of way. So you see none of these have corners. Um, these fully round tanks are called chrysals. Um, we've got pseudo chrysals. Another common one is cylinders. Um, we've got all of these at the academy. Another challenge with jellies besides feeding them and housing them in a way that isn't gonna tear them apart with the corners, um, their food themselves tends to hold pests called hydroids, which are actually really closely related to jellies. They sting just like jellies. Um, and they like to settle out on all the hard corners of their enclosures. So they like to settle out in these little tiny creases way down here at the bottom of our big uh, cylinders and they will sting the jellies. So keeping these clean is really, really important to the health of our animals. Um, I love hearing my guests always ask me, how are these clean? Don't the jellies poop? They poop a ton. <laughs> um, but we are in there every single day, taking all their waste out um, and cleaning off those hydrates to make sure they stay um, really healthy and they're not getting into fights with their cousins in the corners. Um, so behind the scenes, I just wanted to give you a little look. So these are moon jellies that are actually on display right now. Um, in the right of this slide, you can see uh, what we call the sump area. Um, and this is the life support system for our moon jellies. So this tall cylinder on the right is called a bio tower. That's full of a whole bunch of little um, plastic balls. They can also be uh, ceramic balls, um, but basically something with a bunch of surface areas. There's a bunch of stuff in there. Um, and that's housing bacteria that will eat the waste from the jellies and make it less toxic for them, um, which means I don't have to do constant water changes. So they're able to maintain a very uh, neutral chemistry in the water. Um, another thing that's helping with that over here, it's called a protein skimmer. Um, and that is what I like to refer to as a manual seafoam maker. So if you've been ever been at the beach and played in that seafoam, that is actually whipped up animal feces, <laughs> um, all kinds of waste. Um, so air and stuff gets introduced into water, forms bubbles, and the stuff that animal waste is made of actually likes that uh, the membrane between the water and air, and it helps catch that. Um, and these uh, protein skimmers or fractionators bubble up a whole bunch of stuff, bubble it up and out the top, um, and you can see this drain drains all that nasty goo out of my system. Um, so that's helping the water chemistry stay very, very stable. Um, jellies are 95% water. So anything that changes in their systems is going to have a huge impact on the jellies themselves. So we need to make sure that pH is constant, salinity is constant, temperature is constant. Um, when those things changes, it have a massive impact on how they're able to move through the water, on how they're able to adjust where they are. So they might become floaty, they might become really dense and sink to the bottom. They won't be able to move around and get their food as well. Um, and again, this is one of the cylinders. Um, our egg yolks, very similar. Um, you guys might not have been able to see these. These are new on, on display. They're really, really cool. Um, they're probably one of our stingier, actually probably the stingiest jelly we have on exhibit right now. Um, they're in a pseudo chrysal. Um, 
and their systems really pared down. So we only have one on exhibit right now. Um, these guys are incredible medusivores, so we don't want to jam pack their exhibit lest they start eating each other. Um, generally they won't, but just to make sure. Uh, but we do have that protein skimmer on there to take out a bunch of nasty stuff. And then our biggest exhibit is our California sea nettles. Um, so if you've been to the exhibit, uh, it's a window and it's not as big as you might think behind the scenes, it's huge. Um, but this is to replicate what it's like to be out in the ocean diving with jellies. They just drift in from everywhere and they are absolutely beautiful to dive with. Mildly disconcerting because they do sting, um, but they're absolutely gorgeous. And this is really replicating what it's like to be out in the field with them. Behind the scenes, that little window, this is one, there we go, um, is this giant stretch chrysal. Um, so I'm 5'4". That thing's about six feet tall and I think eight feet long. Um, it's massive and it is wonderful to work on. You can see this is kind of what a jelly biologist looks like. So I've got big long gloves that go all the way up to my shoulder so I'm not gonna get stung. Um, long tools that help me work with them, ladders, all kinds of fun stuff. Um, and of course, COVID, I've always got a mask on. Um, but this is this is a really fun exhibit to play with. Um, it's it's basically like a biology frogger. <laughs> um, so it's me cleaning, trying to move around very delicate animals that want to sting me if I do something wrong. So it's a lot of fun to work with. Um, but that is that is kind of the behind the scenes tour at CAS. Um, we're looking forward with, we're always making new exhibits. So just like Venoms, we've got a new jelly in house. Um, we've got tons of space. So it's always a, a fun opportunity to work with the jellies at CAS. Thank you so much, Raya. That was awesome. Um, we do have some questions. Um, and so I, I have, I think we have time for a couple of them. Um, I also want to say thank you for cleaning out their poop every day because <laughs> those tanks are beautiful. Um, yeah, so there's a question kind of about like about jellyfish biology and somebody, and I think this is a great question is what would kill a jellyfish since they don't have like the major organs like brain, heart, lungs, what organ is essential for their survival? Great. Um, Pretty much anything can kill a jellyfish. <laughs> um, they're really, really delicate. So because they're 95% water, um, getting tossed up in the water, getting tossed up out of the water on a wave can kill them. It can rip apart their mesoglia. Um, there's tons of predators. Um, scuba diving, I've seen sea stars eating jellies. Um, they're not very good at getting away from predators and anything sharp in their environment. Bubbles can rip holes through them. Um, lots of things can kill jellies. Um, what about, uh, you know, when you're working with that big sea nettle tank, do the jellies ever get tangled? Do you ever have to go in and that is a great question. So generally jellies don't recognize each other as food. The problem is when more than one jelly recognizes the same piece of food as food mm. and they start trying to eat it at the same time, then we can get tangles. Um, and yes, I've had to untangle jellies quite a few times in my <laughs> career. Um, it is, if you've ever had a jewelry box full of chains or necklaces, it is a lot like untangling that, almost only a lot more nerve wracking because you're trying not to hurt animals that can very easily be torn apart. Yeah. And then um, one more question is, um, what, did jellyfish ever need anything in their tanks for enrichment? Because I know we do a lot of that at the aquarium for all the other animals. That's a great, great question. Our enrichment for jellies, they have no brains. Um, so they're not going to solve puzzles or anything, but it's really simulating um, water flow that they would have. So we create upwelling in all of their systems so you can see them um, moving around. You're not actually seeing them really swimming past the window. What you're seeing them do is interact with um, water flow in their, in their exhibits. Awesome. Um, well, thank you so much for that behind the scenes peek. Um, up next, we have Anna Klompen, um, who is going to be talking about toxins and venom.
Hello. Um, yeah, so my name is Anna Klompen. I'm a PhD student at the University of Kansas, and I study jellyfish venom. Um, and this is probably a great next step because you're probably thinking uh, Kansas, not really known for its jellyfish um, in the area, which means we have to raise our own in the lab. So our lab actually raises um, about six different species in these tanks back here. So we have a lot of polyps and those round tanks with some jellies in there. And I also have here um, that it have a little show and tell. So these are some one day old and one week old baby jellyfish here. So these, uh, these right here, these are moon jellyfish. Um, so they're very clear already and you can probably uh, barely see them in there. They're about a week old. These jellyfish right here, um, they're very closely related to sea nettles and kind of how Julie pointed out before, this is about how big every jellyfish you've seen has started off. Um, so they're starting to get a little bit more active right now. But this is, a, this is a stage that we work with in the lab. My lab usually works on how jellyfish make a medusa, um, but I'm gonna talk about some of their toxins. Uh, so I think I'm ready for the slides now. Thank you. So I'm gonna be talking a little bit about um, some of the myths, debunking some of the myths about jellyfish venom. Uh, but to start off here, um, this is a great intro to talk about these egg yolk jellies. So this one, jellyfish are poisonous, no. All are venomous, and this is a screenshot I took from the venom exhibit that has one of these egg yolks, which are a species that I really love. And just as a review um, for venoms, th these are complex mixtures of toxins produced by an animal that are delivered in some way to be injected, um, and they're for the purpose of predation, defense, or some other ecological use. And I think once you understand that, that venom has a very specific task for different species of jellyfish, that kind of points you to this myth number two. Not all jellyfish are trying to hurt you. Um, their venom is tailored for the food that they eat, which is usually zooplankton, or defend against predators, which as we heard, could be a lot of different things. Um, so these are actually some of our polyps. So those red jellies I showed before that are like sea nettles um, that are eating one day old brine shrimp is what they were doing. So let me play that again real quick. So this is the brine shrimp that we're feeding that are very small and their venom is targeted for eating these kinds of invertebrates. So their venom uh, at this stage is not gonna really hurt you. I could touch these um, and they'll gonna try to sting you, but they can't really. Um, but once they're adults, um, their venom is then moving towards eating other jellyfish and fish. Um, so that's when their venoms can start uh, actually hurting you as well. So myth number two, not all, not all jellyfish are trying to hurt you. But another um, common thing that I hear is that there's some jellyfish that have adapted not to sting. So these are some images from uh, the famous jellyfish lake, um, which has these golden jellies that uh, don't uh, seem to have sting you. Um, and so a lot of people say they've adapted not to sting. That's not the case. All jellyfish can sting. They all have stinging cells that I'll talk about in a moment. And to um, our knowledge, all jellyfish have venom of some sort. It just might be that venom doesn't target you. So these jellyfish are filter feeders. They're eating very small zooplankton. So unless you're in there for a long period of time with exposed skin, they're not going to harm you. We talked about medusivores a little bit as well. So these are two videos of some medusivores I've gotten to work with, one of which is the egg yolk um, that I'm actually feeding a moon jellyfish in this tank. Um, but over on the left-hand side, that's the little hydromedusa that was actually eating another hydromedusa. Uh, so again, these jellies that are uh, eating other jellies, often their venom is not as irritating to people. Um, but that doesn't mean they're not stinging. They have venom of some sort. We just don't know what it looks like quite yet. So I talked about stinging cells um, before. So this is the, what gives uh, jellyfish their power, is these microscopic tiny cells um, that inside hold a capsule. And within that capsule, there is venom is contained. And when those stinging cells fire, um, they often have a barb and these spines that help kind of push out. And then the thread that gets injected into the predator or prey. Um, and from the end of that, that's where the venom comes out. So I'm gonna play this video. Um, it's gonna be super quick. Uh, you're probably just gonna see some threads kind of appearing from the edge. So the discharge of a stinging cell is one of the, is the fastest reaction that we know um, in nature. Uh, it's less than a millionth of a second that these things get discharged. And the power of these is pretty enormous. Um, it can be greater than 5 million Gs of force. And that's really to push the stinging cell, that bar part, into the predator and prey um, because these are delicate animals. Um, so this is really adapted to be a really kind of forceful thing that's happening. 
seem to be playing again. <laughs> but herein lies the problem as someone who's interested in venom with jellyfish is that because the stinging cells are so small, studying jellyfish venoms is very, very difficult. It's not like snakes um, or scorpions, which many of which are difficult, but they have a venom gland. They have a central gland where they're producing these venoms, which you can often either take out or make the animal um, kind of inject their venom into a beaker. That's not the case with jellyfish. So here I have actually um, some stinging cells that I isolated from this little tiny jellyfish called hydra or, or little cnidarian. This wide group is cnidarians, nettle bearing animals, animals that have nettles, barbs, stinging cells. So these animals um, are found in labs all over the world. They're a few millimeters in size. And essentially to get these stinging cells, I had to grind up this animal uh, go through several different solutions to actually pull out stinging cells from the rest of the tissue. And even then, um, I only have a very small amount of stinging cells to work with. And you can see here kind of a comparison. So a fine ballpoint pen, 0.8 millimeters, about is how thin that line is going to be. For these stinging cells here, you could fit about eight of them within that line. They're extremely small, extremely small amounts of venom. So animals have hundreds or thousands of these that they're using, but when we're trying to study them, that uh, can be really problematic just from the amount that you really don't get to work with. So I just wanted to hone in on this too, um, of what the stinging cell looks like, because these are incredible little cells that these animals are making. So um, here, these uh, types of stinging cells are called stenotils. So these are in hydra, and you can see from that really detailed image down there, how sharp those spines, the intricacy of those barbs, these are powerful um, little cells, uh, and they're just so complex uh, looking. It, it kind of amazes me when I look at these. They're one of my favorite types of stinging cell um, to look at. But there are, uh, to complicate things more, um, jellyfish have multiple kinds of stinging cells, often multiple types in the same animal. So here's an image of just a few different types of stinging cells. You can see there's a variety of barbs, spines, um, and on that left-hand image, uh, there's even stinging cells that probably don't have venom. So uh, the ones labeled A and D over there, those are just entanglement stinging cells. They're not meant to inject venom, they're just meant to entangle an animal. On the right-hand side, those are images I took of stinging cells just from one species um, that I'll talk about in a bit. And this is just to give you a sense of how different um, some of the sizes can be. So those uh, in that bottom image, though you see the large capsules of those um, stinging cells that have the barbs, and then those tiny little round stinging cells. So what I was showing you before, as small as that was, is one of the largest types of stinging cells. Normally what I have to work with is even smaller than that. Um, so there's other strategies we can use to look at venom, um, because the amounts that you get from these, you just need so many animals, uh, and they're often too small um, to really get that amount. So I'll talk about that a little bit more as well. So myth four, um, some of you might be familiar with this, is uh, does a jellyfish have to be alive um, or even touch you to really sting you? Uh, no, dead jellyfish can sting you. And um, I have a personal example of that. So up in the corner there, so that's my hand next to a dead lion's mane. Um, for my curiosity, I got a bit of tentacle on my wrist, um, hurt for about two or three hours. Wasn't very comfortable, but it was worth it uh, to, to kind of uh, just see the super cool jelly that I don't get to see often in Kansas. Uh, and then in the other, the bottom corner, that's a Portuguese manifor. So this is in the hydrozoan group. Um, these aren't like true jellyfish, but you can see those long dangly bits. Those are, um, those are covered in stinging cells. They can often break off of that animal and be washed away, and you can get stung just from that broken off piece of tentacle. Uh, so it, stinging cells, when they're uh, created by the animal, they're semi-independent at that point. The jellyfish doesn't have that much control of, about the sting. It's a mechanical cue. So just running into it, it's going to make those fire. Because of that, the animal does not need to be alive, or the tentacle doesn't need to be attached to the animal anymore to sting you, um, which can cause a lot of problems, obviously. Something else I want to talk about in a project that I've worked on is actually on stinging mucus from a jellyfish. So this is my hand again against some upside down jellyfish. These are jellies that just live on the bottom. Um, they're all across the world in warm waters. And they produce these kind of mucus nets um, that they use to catch food. But when you're snorkeling over top, because these are beautiful animals to look at, 
you can kick up that mucus and any exposed skin is going to start to get really irritated and sometimes can be moderately painful. Um, so a group of us wanted to look at this stinging snot and we found out they actually have these little capsules within them uh, that you can see in the corner in the snot um, that were undescribed stinging cell structures that we call cathosomes. They are covered in these little tiny stinging cells um, that are released up into this mucus. And this next video I'm going to show, um, what I didn't tell you is these cathosomes are mobile. You're going to see a whole bunch of isolated cathosomes moving around. Uh, and then I'm going to introduce some brine shrimp. So again, these are not animals. These are just stinging cell structures released in the mucus. So right where you see some of those brine shrimp getting hit, you might already see that this is either very potent, very quick, but a minute later, it's very obvious. Um, these cathosomes have more than enough power in the, in the toxin arsenal to capture prey. So it's almost certain that the cause of the stinging mucus is because it's full of these cathosomes in here. This is a really fun project to work on, um, just in terms certainly of the headlines that this got. But th this is something that we can now apply as a safety measure, too, to know what this mucus does. Um, that's an important part of studying venom, too, is that there is a big safety component. So myth number five, and this is one that was believed for a long time, that if jellyfish venom is less complex, because they themselves are morphologically not as complex. But this is absolutely not the case. Uh, jellyfish venoms contain hundreds of different toxins that do very diverse things. There's neurotoxins that can cause, um, in humans, muscle spasms, paralytics. Uh, there's other toxins that attack your blood, attack your skin, attack your heart, um, or just attack various kinds of cells very generally. But we can also, within venoms, you can find certain toxins that can be used as antimicrobials, insecticides. There's a sea anemone uh, toxin in phase three trials right now for autoimmune disease. Um, so their venoms are really as complex as you would assume a snake or a scorpion or some insects are that we have a lot more knowledge about. Jellyfish have just as diverse um, and bioactive uh, venom as these animals. And that's probably something uh, you all are already familiar with. So jellyfish can sting you. Now just think of that fact for a moment. There are something as simple as this um, is able to cause pain. Um, and this is just a kind of a smattering of some of those species. Um, there's box jellyfish at either side, uh, the lion's mane and sea nettle in there, and that Portuguese man of war. And I just want you to think that how powerful this chemical arsenal is, um, that the stings from these animals can cause all these problems, pain ranging from mild to severe, um, scarring that could last for days, maybe months, allergic reactions just like a bees and wasps. Um, they could cause swelling, itching, or breathing issues. Uh, you could go into anaphylaxis from a sting from a jellyfish. Um, if you haven't heard of Irukandji syndrome, highly recommend you look it up. This is probably the worst thing other than killing you that could happen to you from a sting, and it's from that tiny little jellyfish in the corner. Uh, 11 out of 10 on the pain scale, vomiting, uh, back pain, nausea, anxiety, a sense of impending due. Hours, if not days, in a hospital, guaranteed from a sting from one of those jellies. And then um, we heard about these before. So over on the left, that's the Australian box jellyfish, Pyronex pleckeri, widely renowned as the most uh, venomous animal in the world for humans. Um, these can, the toxins in these attack your blood and attack your heart, um, and these can be fatal things that you get from these. And I just wanted to show this because I think this is an amazing piece of work that's just come out uh, in the last few days. So this is Olivia Rowley. She's a PhD student in Australia. And she's actually helping in Australia where these jellyfish are a problem. They're actually using drones now to spot these animals in the water um, and using this as a potential safety measure to get people out of the water because these are large animals, but they're nearly invisible. Um, so you're gonna see an image of one of these jellies in the water in a second. So the bell part can be fairly large. Um, the tentacles could be five, six meters long. You can see some of the tentacles there. Two meters of one of those tentacles, you have two or three minutes. Uh, and then it's cardiac arrest and lethal sting. So incredible work coming from her, which I think is awesome. All right, the last myth. This is probably one many of you are familiar with too. Um, and you've probably heard the pee on a jellyfish sting. Um, well, I am here to tell you do not do that as a jellyfish venomologist. Um, and I want to be clear that I am not a medical professional, but I am going to tell you some of the certain don'ts to these things. Um, 
the best thing for you to do though, no matter what, if you're going to the beach or wherever you're going, is check the local safety pages for what species you're in your area and what recommendations they are. Never apply fresh water. Fresh water often will make stinging cells discharge um, more. Uh, that's kind of what urine does as well. If you pee on it, you're probably gonna make more singing cells fire. And what you're trying to do, you need to get uh, the pieces of tentacle or the jellyfish off where it's stung. You need to stop any more stinging cells from firing. And then you want to deactivate any venom that might have already been injected into you. So removing tentacles with tweezers or in any way that doesn't rub the area, um, just you need to pluck it off as uh, safely as possible. For most species, vinegar seems to work as a way to deactivate stinging cells that are left on, on the skin where, where you've been stung. Um, but for some species, this might actually make it worse. So check the local safety pages wherever you are. And there are commercial products as well. And then hot water, hot as you can handle after that, um, that'll deactivate any venom uh, proteins or toxins that might have been injected. But if you have any breathing issues, any um, major pain issues, just go to the emergency room. It's always better to be safe. So I know I'm reaching near the end, but I just briefly want to talk about what I actually do. So I work on this um, little hydroid. So we talked about hydroids before. So I, this is a hydroid that I work on um, that actually lives on the shell of hermit crabs. Uh, and you can find uh, hermit crabs with this uh, little hydroid uh, all along the um, Atlantic coast. So on that hermit crab there, what you're seeing, so you're seeing a bunch of fluff. That's all one animal. Uh, it's a colonial hydroid, all one animal, one genotype. And part of my PhD is exploring the venom of this animal um, at a really in-depth scale because we can culture it um, here in the lab. And the one of, this is an amazing animal um, because as a colony, it actually deviates uh, different polyps to do specific functions. So the same way we have different organs in our body, there's different polyps that have very specific roles. So there's a gastrozoid, these eat and capture prey. They're the only polyps with a mouth. But there's also these dactylozoids that only catch food, no mouth, and then gonozoids, males or females, only uh, produce gametes, no mouth. And actually, I've learned from my work that the venom between these three is completely different. Uh, and in fact, those two kinds of polyps that capture prey actually have toxins that are very, very similar to box jellyfish, specifically the toxins that attack your heart and attack blood. Uh, which, but this jellyfish is, har is harmless. It's very small, maybe a few millimeters. I touch these with my hands all the time to move them around. Um, but uh, part of what I do as an evolutionary biologist is I'm asking why and how. How is it that these particular jellies have very similar toxins to the box jellyfish, and why? Why is it that they have these toxins that are so potent otherwise? Um, why do they need these in for them to survive uh, and able to capture prey? So I'm gonna be working on these and doing some gene editing techniques, actually. So we're gonna be knocking out genes um, using techniques like CRISPR um, to see if we can actually make these toxins non-functional and see if they can capture food. So I'm using some really complicated um, molecular techniques to look at the venoms of this species, which might help inform the venoms of some other species as well. And I wanna make a quick plug. If you haven't um, seen these comics, so they're interviews with invertebrates. This is a comic series written by a grad student that does these on a ton of different invertebrate research with a lot of different researchers. She did one on my hydroids, um, which I'm in love with after seeing uh, uh, seeing at her conference, she did this on some projects that I was showing there. Um, highly recommend going and looking up interviews with invertebrates. Um, really wonderful stuff there. And I'm going to leave it at this. Um, these are some books if you're interested in venoms or jellyfish more widely. I, I actually had finalists up before I knew Julie was going to be a speaker. Um, of course, thank my funding, and I would be happy if I had some time to answer any questions. Thank you so much. Hi, Anna. Um, that was amazing. Uh, Christina actually just got a text from her mom that I think sums up a bit of what many of us might be feeling. And it, this is interesting, but jellies are too scary. So shout out to Christina's mom. Um, we have time for maybe like two questions. Um, mm -hmm. So the first one is how much energy is used up when a jellyfish stings? 
How many mm -hmm. students can they give in a certain amount of time? It's a great question. So um, that's something being studied right now. So it seems like Jelly's put a lot of energy into making making stinging cells for one, and then making the venom is another. Um, so when you touch uh, jellyfish, so let's go with like Hydra, for instance. When you're touching Hydra, they're going to just fire a ton of these stinging cells. And the one stimulus they seem to have is that when a stinging cell fires, the ones nearby tend to fire as well. So once they fire a cell, they actually drop that cell, and then they start making a new one right away. So it's actually a lot of energy, um, and that's part of what makes it interesting for me, is that because there's a lot of energy, that means there's um, an evolutionary cost. So every venom uh, toxin that they're making has to have a purpose, and that's part of what I'm studying. And uh, I would say in terms of after they sting, um, that kind mm -hmm. of varies with species. Um, probably uh, the, uh, um, Aquarius would know this better, um, but I think at least for the ones that I, I've been stung by and whatnot, it um, could be a few hours, uh, could, um, Probably less than a day, though, for them to recover a lot of those singing cells. So it kind of depends on how healthy the animal is as well. But they that's their main way of interacting. So cool. Um, and then time for one more. So do jellies trap preys with these isolated stinging cell capsules? Um, would they harvest them later? Yeah, so those upside on jellyfish are adorable. So this is what happens is they make this like mucus net, like I said, they like release out this net and it stays attached to the animal. It seems to, it probably captures some stuff. And then they basically wipe this mucus over themselves because they have a bunch of little mouths. They don't have one mouth, it's a bunch of mouths. Mm -hmm. And by wiping that mucus, they seem to pick up whatever food they caught in those little nets that they've made. It's kind of adorable. Um, but these cassiosomes seem to be uh, released only when they're disturbed, um, probably by a predator or something else. Um, so it's probably used a bit for prey capture and a bit for predator deterrent. Um, but the mucus is really entangling stuff for them to wipe over themselves. So but that's a great question. Um, we're not totally sure, but that's what I think about, but we know thus far. I like how you call the mucus net adorable. <laughs> it's, I, I mean, of things jellyfish do, that's a pretty adorable thing. <laughs> I think. <laughs> Cool. Um, thank you so much, Anna. Um, up next, we have Nick Bazayo. Bazayo, I think I pronounced that correctly. Um, yeah, take it away, Nick. Hey, how's it going? Uh, I don't know if I can follow up with adorable little mucus nets, but I'll definitely try my best. Um, so hello everyone. I hope everyone is doing awesome tonight and I hope everyone is enjoying the talk so far. So uh, I just want to reintroduce myself. My name is Nicholas Vizio and I'm actually an independent science illustrator. And I actually specialize in drawing marine life, most notably uh, marine vertebrates. I got my start actually studying uh, marine biology and later science illustration at Roger Williams University and uh, California State University in Monterey Bay, which is always a mouthful. <laughs> and I have had the pleasure of creating uh, numerous illustrations for places like Ambari, the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institution, as well as the Smithsonian Natural History Museum, and the Natural History Magazine, to name a few. And tonight, I'm actually going to be hopefully doing a nice little quick talk to you about a little project I started eh, roughly around a year ago, and I probably will be working on for the next like several decades which is gonna be creating an illustrated guide to jellyfish of the world. And on here screen is actually a little drawing I've done of the uh, quote unquote immortal jellyfish Teratopsis dornii. So I guess like the first main thing is why jellyfish? Well, like, like with many of the other speakers have mentioned, jellyfish play a very crucial role in the world's oceans. And we have this great impact on humans the world over. Uh, unfortunately, most notably, many people know jellyfish to be extremely damaging to things like the tourism industry or the fishing industry, where they can scare away swimmers and tourists and eat fish larvae that can cause like collapses in the, in the local fishing populations. But it is important to note that these very ethereal beauty animals are vital and crucial to the world's food web, and they actually have been vital for over 500 to 700 million years so far. So 
that that's why I'm actually attempting to make a guide that aims to include all jellyfish known to science currently, which is definitely a endeavor to do, and to make a guide that can be useful not only for researchers to identify current or new species, but for anyone in the general public to be able to go out to their local dock or their local beach, find a jellyfish swimming around and be like, that's what that is. So the, so the goal of the guide is to make the finding identification so much easier and readily available than what it currently is. And I want this guide to make people fall in love with jellyfish the same way I did, and not just think of them as these strange alien creatures you can only observe in the aquarium. And just to really talk about them on the screen, uh, up here we actually have a few examples of some of the drawings I'm doing for this project. And one of the things I, that I love doing these drawings is that you really get to admire just how diverse jellyfish look physically. You can have things that look like ribbons, like up in the upper left. You have ones with the standard tentacles on the right. Ones that are just uh, really flamboyant. And in the middle, some that look like plastic bags, some that look like Christmas trees. It really is just an amazing thing to see. And you can even see here, you even have more that are just trash bags. You even have many of the box jellyfish on the left and right. But even though they're both box jellyfish, they're both uniquely shaped and beautiful in their own way. So I actually wanted to start uh, creating this guide back when I was an undergraduate studying uh, marine, at the Marine Biological Laboratory in Massachusetts. Um, and it was back there at the laboratory that whenever I caught these strange new jellyfish in a plankton net, I would instantly want to run over to the local library and look through as many books as I could. Unfortunately, I have to go through more books than I'm willing to admit in order to figure out what species I was actually looking at. And even when I did find that description, the, it was only roughly like a paragraph at most. And if I was lucky, it had a very simple, loose line drawing that could easily be interpreted as any number of species. So it was at that point that I knew we had to fix this. We had to make this new, better guide to jellyfish out there that I know I would definitely want it as a kid. So I guess like one thing to bring up though is there are actually currently two main sources of jellyfish identification that people use today to research them. The most recent one is actually being published only last year in 2019. And it's this amazing guide focusing on the diversity of Skyphozoans, aka the true jellyfish, things like sea nettles and moon jellyfish. And it's also things like box jellyfish, like on the left and right that you can see on the screen, which are which can give this extremely nasty sting that Anna talked about just recently. And this, it is a very beautiful, insightful guide, but it does only cover two of the roughly five classifications of jellyfish that we know of today. The second major identification that we actually have, which is a three volume guide authored by a guy named Meyer back in 1910. So as you can imagine, it's a little bit out of date, although it has beautiful line illustrations and beautiful written descriptions of several species. Unfortunately, some of the material hasn't lasted and hasn't archived well over time. So there is definitely this great need for a vision of a new guide. So one of the things I wanna briefly run through is what really goes on in creating one of my jellyfish illustrations, and most importantly, is my, my setup. Although this image that's on the screen was actually taken back when I was interning at the Smithsonian, back uh, before the pandemic was a thing, uh, all my jellyfish illustrations are done by painting in Photoshop and like contain at least a at least hundred layers in Photoshop per drawing. And as you can see me in my clearly awesome hoodie, actually working on a project for Dr. Alan Collins on this humongous drawing tablet that I was loaned by by a fellow researcher at the institution, which I'm forever grateful for. And while I'm working on these illustrations, uh, typically I don't actually use that many like fancy tools beyond Photoshop. I only really use like the standard brushes that come along with the program. On occasion, I will use um, a custom made brush set that is inspired by Studio Ghibli. And I'll use those brushes to really make these fancy details that really make the jellyfish illustration pop. So when it comes to creating my illustrations, the first actually like major step 
of course, like anything in science is research, research, research. And when it, and research is the most important detail, especially when it comes, especially because it's what I fall back onto while I'm drawing to make sure all of the details are accurate and present in the final product. Most commonly, I try and find like the original description. And if I'm lucky, the original drawing, like what you see here on this little seen species of box jellyfish from the South Atlantic. This species was initially first described in Meyer 1910, that really old uh, guide to jellyfish I mentioned previously. And it should also be mentioned that during this time in history, it unfortunately was a common thing in science illustration to slightly stylize and uh, morph certain morphological features. Like what you can see here in the drawing, you have these really ornate fan-shaped pedalia that you just don't actually see in the living organism like what you see here. They're actually much more tame and more like little like hooks that just kind of hang off. So pretty much like once I can actually find these original descriptions, I actually start to hunt down images like what you see here on the right uh, of animals, of the actual animal itself, or maybe relatives that are close on, on the phylogenetic tree. And I either find these by just simply Googling them and getting lucky, or I relentlessly email researchers, or I actually try and loan out specimens from museums. Um, in some cases, I am lucky and I do find images of the species I am looking for. But in most cases, unfortunately, I have to go off of either poorly preserved specimens or nothing but just a lump of mesoglea and maybe a couple of stinging cells, or I just have to guess what the animal looks like based off the initial description and what relative animals look like. And this after doing all this back laboring research, I actually get to go into like the real fun part of the illustration work, which is turning this original drawing on the left and turning it into my interpretation, my interpretation of the species on the right. Most notably, once this image actually cycles through, um, in order to make the drawing, I start with this rough outline, turning the original drawing of what the anatomy is to try and figure out where all the important description features are, to figure out what this species should look like, what color it should be. And this is the big backbone that I always fall back onto while I'm drawing, make sure I'm never going off track. Beyond this, the next step is always just like filling in the animal, doing solid colors, making sure that um, you figure out like where all these different organs and little structures are, given jellyfish are beautifully transparent, it can get a little messy sometimes. So moving on from here, it goes into the lovely ugly potato phase where I just gently blotch in colors, add some blue, some yellows, trying to get in depth and point and actually show off the form of the animal, showing how it eventually takes shape and you actually start to actually see what the final product's gonna look like. It's like after that, I then begin to like fine tune my drawing by cleaning up the edges adding small details, really taking that time, which can take days, to really make that drawing pop and give this sense of life, and breath, and movement. And it's here that really makes the drawings, uh, really makes them impactful because I want them to make, I want them to appear that they can just swim off the page. It's almost like they are alive on this 2D surface. And I guess like one of the biggest tips I have to anyone who is like inspiring to be an artist or inspiring to go in and like study these animals and do artwork and draw your local wildlife is, especially jellyfish, is just study the animal and what it looks like in real life, how it moves, how light reflects off of it, or in this case, at least like how light transfers through it and even how it behaves. Uh, one of my favorite places to actually like take notes about how jellyfish should look is actually watching like deep sea exploration live streams on YouTube, like the Okeanos and Evie Nautilus and Mbari to name a few, because they do amazing work. And if anyone actually watches them, I highly recommend it because it's just a great way to spend a Saturday afternoon <laughs> just watching a bunch of scientists just explore the ocean, find squid, find jellyfish, find a crab eating a clam, never know. But in the end of all this, typically each illustration of mine will take roughly three to two weeks.
to completion. So as you can imagine, it's not a very quick process, unfortunately. So I guess just like really to wrap it up here, um, kind of going off of what everyone else has been talking about previously, jellyfish life cycles, baby jellyfish. That is another thing that really needs to get touched up upon because we don't really know how many jellyfish live and what their life cycles look like in, uh, in, the, in the natural habitat. Many of them do have these polyp stages and then they alternate between polyp and medusa and back, but many of them also only live in uh, the water column, or many of them only live living on a certain rock, or some of them only live under mussels. And it's important to like document this beautiful like transition, as you can see here in these two illustrations of a moon jellyfish on the left and the scolionema jellyfish on the right, uh, and like showing that even though this is what the adult medusa looks like it can look completely different somewhere else in the life cycle, which is very important. But beyond that, I guess like in the end, uh, even though I just want to mention that I, although I am known to like draw jellyfish and I love doing it with a passion, I am experienced actually in drawing many other subjects for my clients, such as plants, fish, cells, birds, and reptiles. And I love drawing all of them and just bringing them to light and just sharing like all these unique features of the natural world of people through illustrations. Although I will admit, I, uh, I do have invertebrates closer to my heart and they are my favorite thing to draw. And yeah, I just want to say thank you everyone so much for listening to my talk. And if there are any questions, I'd be more than willing to answer them if I can. Yeah, yeah. we've got questions. Oh, we've got questions. <laughs> I can hear my echo and I'm, um, but anyway, just I'm just going to mute you so that echo doesn't show up for people. But um, wouldn't it be funny if you could only draw jellies? Like I like at the end that you were like, <laughs> like I can also draw other things. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think a really like a basic question that a lot of people just want to know is um, like, how do you get into scientific illustration and doing it, you know, kind of for work? Yeah, so I guess like, I actually like kind of started back when I was an undergrad uh, studying for my bachelor's uh, in like laboratories. I'd always draw in my notebooks, like just like during the experiments, like whenever. And it was, when I was actually able to figure out as I was an undergrad, I actually took a class called science illustration where mostly it was like kind of at the beginning start where you like draw clay. But it was there I actually figured out that, hey, I like to do science. I like to draw. There's actually a career out there that you can actually combine both together. And it was there that I actually got to learn uh, more science illustration over at uh, California State University in Monterey Bay, where they actually have a program specifically dedicated to teaching people how to do proper scientific illustration. So, yeah. Awesome. Um, I also really like this comment that Lauren wrote that said, this project looks so ambitious, but what a beautiful way to spend the next few decades. So are you gonna spend the next few decades? Oh yeah, it's gonna be, I keep telling everyone's like, oh, he has a great project. Uh, come check at me at like 30 years maybe, and maybe I'll be like close to being done. But it's like, it is like ambitious because there's like, the number keeps rising like every year but there's at least like 5,000 species of jellyfish in the world, ranging from everything from like the giant jellyfish, like lion's mane, to um, the small jellyfish called Cicero medusa, that is the size of a grain of sand. So it'll be an ambitious project, but you know what? If it takes my whole life to do it, it'll be a good life. <laughs> worthy, worthy cause. Yeah. Um, we need again, because I also want to read you another comment that just said, this is like listening to Bob Ross paint a happy cloud, but with jellies. <laughs> Have yeah, you ever gone that before? I've always wanted to be Bob Ross of jellyfish world. <laughs> um, oh, well, wow. Thank you very much. That, that means a lot. <laughs> well, thank you so much, uh, Nick, for joining us. And um, what's your website so people can go look at more? Uh, yeah, it's uh, www.nickbazio.com. It's all one word. You can also find me on Twitter at like Nicholas Bazio. It's 
pretty strange last name. So I, I pop up pretty quickly. <laughs> okay. Awesome. Thank you so much. You. Have a good night. I'm going to bring Lynn back. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Uh, thanks to everyone for tuning in and special thanks to Julie, Raya, Anna, and Nick. Um, next week, we're slowing it down with our tree dwelling, slow moving sloth friends. Uh, we got a suggestion uh, for a sloth theme. So we heard you and we're doing it. Um, so next week here about adventures of catching a sloth, which is apparently harder than you think. Um, we'll also take a trip back in time to a prehistoric giant sloth boneyard. And then we'll also learn about the co-evolution of sloths and algae. So all next week, come back and join us. Yeah. And um, I also wanted to say to our local viewers that you can now go watch our jellies all day if you want to. The Academy um, has reopened. Um, we're really, really happy to be able to say that. So um, go, go stare at jellies. Um, nightlife isn't coming back just yet, but we'll be the first to let you know um, when we are back. And in the meantime, like Lynn said, night school is continuing. So subscribe to YouTube if you haven't already to our channel and um, you'll get notifications whenever we go live. So thank you so much. It's so great to be back with all of you. Thanks for your enthusiastic jelly comments. And uh, yeah, we'll see you next week. Night.